the 2024 Flow Track College Cross Country Rankings show presented by Hoka. I'm Ashley Tetchins here, joined by Corey Mall. Corey, it's, it's hard to believe it's cross country season. Loving it. Loving the fall. Love cross country. Ready for it. Well, what exactly is this show? Well, you know, we're going to begin this new show here this season, and, you know, we're going to reveal today our preseason NCAA cross country rankings for Division I, as well as we'll dive into some of the top storylines heading into the big fall season ahead of us. And then to help us tackle all this, we also have a very special guest analyst, Matt Baxter, who is a current member of the NIZ Elite team up in Flagstaff, a five-time All-American and three-time team cross-country champion while at NAU from 2016 to 2018. And then he's even published the book Running Up the Mountain about the origins and story behind NAU's running program. Matt, thank you so much for joining us and helping us be a part of this first show. Yeah, Ashley and Corey, thank you guys so much for having me on. I, I love talking about NCAA cross. So I'm really excited about this. Well, I know we're all really looking forward to it. So, hey, let's go ahead and dive into things. Let's begin first with, I mean, goodness, like the season hasn't already started, but there's so many storylines and just news to talk about and, you know, intriguing, compelling things with huge implications for this fall. So let's go into our top three storylines to watch, beginning with first news that broke earlier this week. Mike Smith leaving NAU at the conclusion of the 2025 indoor and outdoor seasons, being replaced by his longtime assistant, Jared Cornfield, who's in his ninth year at NAU. Obviously, this is huge news, right? I mean, Mike Smith has, you know, he's created a culture here at NAU that, you know, it breeds champions. And so this is, you know, a big, a big move, and he's going to be going to pursue professional coaching opportunities. Matt, I want to go to you first, obviously, with, you know, your experience being part of that, that, that team there at NAU back in the day. Like, exactly what does this news mean going into the cross-country season, especially for NAU? Yeah, this is this is a huge thing for not only NCAA cross country in general, but definitely for NAU and for that program. I was I was on the team when when Mike first came in in, in 2016 when he overlapped with Eric Hines and and funnily enough, like I I know a, a bit of what these athletes are going through right now. I was on a team when a coach announced that that they were leaving and, and moving on to something else and. And Mike was the one who was coming in to take over. And a lot of us were really apprehensive about having him come in because we didn't know anything about him. We didn't know if this was going to be the, the death of the program of NAU, uh, which seems crazy to think about now because Mike has had such an incredible impact on the program. And I think it's it's going to be tough with him going because he's his personality and empathy and the way that he works with athletes is, is genuinely special. And I think that's the piece that a lot of people overlook, that he's an incredible coach. He puts together great training plans. He gets people peaking at the right time. But when you sit down with him in the office and you talk to him and you have a conversation with him, you oftentimes walk out of there feeling like you can do things you, you didn't believe you could do before. And so he's definitely going to leave a, a bit of a void in, the, in that respect within the program. But we have Jared Cornfield taking over. Jared Cornfield, I've known since he was a GA on the team. He's been with the program for, for nine years, and he's just an incredible piece of this program. He's a great coach. He's extremely knowledgeable. He's an excellent recruiter, and he's, he's just going to be the perfect person to come in, take over, um, and, and keep this, this program moving forward. Corey, what are your thoughts here? Again, just like Matt just said, like, you know, Mike Smith has just been, he's created something that's, Hard to replace, right? Even though you have someone like Jared Cornfield who's ready to come in and step up and continue leading on this program. I think it helps to have that runway. Jared knows the program, understands what it takes and what all the all, all the stakes are in cross and outdoor and indoor. So he understands that that's a great one, right? Runway. But it's massive. When you think of, you know, brand names and coaching circles in the NCAA cross sector, Mike Smith is a huge one. Very few men kind of grab you know, the, the headlines like he does, you know, coaching a team like NAU, it's going to be a big impact when, when, he, when he leaves. Um, you look at all the guys that he has developed over the years who have become outright stars. Um, you know, Matt, obviously, you know, really early on, Louis Grijalva, Abdi Hamid Nur, Jordi Beamish, Matt Baxter, as, as I mentioned, Nico Young, Drew Bosley, like all these guys became stars under, under Mike Smith's uh, tutelage there. And you just don't find coaches like that everywhere. Um, you can't just hire them anywhere. Um, I think Cornfield is a great, in a great position to have success right away. 
But on the one side, there are going to be a ton of expectations, right? You know, Mike hands off to Jared. Now you accept all those responsibilities. And how he navigates that is going to be sort of the testament of, of his first years there. But I think he's more than capable knowing what, what's at stake. And it's an interesting, you know, position to be in too, right? Like if you look at, you know, they didn't win the title last year on the men's side. The women were runner-ups. Like now knowing this is going to be, you know, Mike Smith's last, you know, cross-country season at the helm, like does that add a little bit more motivation now for the team to, to try to get back on top and, and win a title on the men's side and potentially on the women's side as well? Absolutely. Last year you want to make it a good one uh, for them. And really this year is, is critical because they've had such great recruiting classes come in over the past two, three years. A lot of the guys who have been sort of in waiting are going to get that opportunity to be the factors, the sole you know, beneficiaries of being in, in, the, in the starting seven there. So I think it's a big year. It's also one that you really want to capitalize on all you have left. Sticking with big coaching news here, I think our second top storyline going into this cross-country season has to be former Tennessee director of cross-country Sean Carlson getting hired by Colorado on July 25th to become its director of cross-country and track and field, seventh head coach in the program's history. I mean, this is just a, a huge move for a historically well-known program. Now you have someone new coming in, taking the helm. What does this mean and like, what's its impact here, do you think, Corey? I think it's a, it's a changing of the guard. You look at Colorado, you know, if you, if you look at Colorado as a whole, it, it is a brand name in, in this sport, and Mark Wetmore was their CEO. So you're replacing a CEO in, in Sean Carlson there. And what he brings to the table is basically, you know, new way of thinking, new style, new tactics, you know, a really engaging style of recruiting. I think Sean Carlson, one of his biggest strengths is getting people to believe in what he envisions for them. Uh, so that's why he's been so successful in recruiting over the last you know, five plus years at Notre Dame and at Tennessee. You look at Tennessee before he got there, it really needed some work to be done and he got it done very, very quickly. So he enters into a situation at Colorado already pretty good, but they want to get back to that position where they were among the greats. And I think you know, it will take maybe a little bit of time, but that name paired with Sean Carlson's ability and, and, and style could get them there pretty quickly. Matt, you know, with you being in this space for quite some time, knowing that long history that Colorado's had with the Wetmores, just how much does a move like this mean for a program? And then how do you think Sean Carlson can come in and, and try to revive some of that? Yeah, I, I only really found out about Sean and when I had to. When he was at Notre Dame and in 2020 during the pandemic, Notre Dame was right there pushing NAU to the finish line. And I honestly thought they were going to win that year. Um, NAU won, thankfully, on my side of things, uh, but they scared us, definitely. And so he's someone who's going to want to win, and he's going to want to win on the grass. And Colorado has the reputation of performing really well on the grass. And so we know, we most of us have read Running with the Buffaloes, and, and lots of us would have read it at times when it was inspiring for us, when we we're a high school runner or, or a, an early college runner, and it kind of set the standard of, like, this is what you need to do to be great. And so for Sean coming in now, he's, he's stepping in and he's taken over a program that people, people have a lot of respect for. People really like and respect Colorado and they, they want to see someone like Sean come in and, and take it, continue to take it to the next level and, and start winning some more titles back on the grass again. And I think he's going to be huge for them. And he's, he's a fresh face. He's a young guy who's going to have great ideas. He's going to have a whole different training method that he's going to put the, the Colorado buffs through. Um, and I think he's just going to overall be a great fit for that program. And I think even leading into the season, we saw some of his impact early on. A lot of you know, guys that, and gals that were with him at Tennessee and some incoming recruits as well switched to Colorado. So we'll, I think we'll see a pretty young team, a deep team, and I'm excited to see what you know, they're going to do this upcoming fall. But I think our final storyline, it's a big one. I think it has to be talking about the NAU women, right? Like I think last year, one of the biggest things that came out of the NCAA Cross Country Championships was that they finished runner up to NC State by just one point. You know, I think there's a lot of back and forth between like, oh, who's going to win the Wolfpack or the Lumberjacks? And they ended up finishing in second there. Is now 2024, especially considering everything that's going on with Mike Smith and everything, is 2024 the year that the NAU potentially wins a title? And, and Matt, I want to go to you first since, um, you know, obviously you know the legacy there at NAU. Yeah, I was, I was watching 
the NCAA cross country championships last year at Luis Grijalva's house uh, with some other NAU alumni. And, and when that woman's race finished, it actually originally showed that the NAU woman won. And so we were losing, oh my gosh, we've won, it's incredible. And then it refreshed and we were second. Um, and it's really hard when you go from thinking you've won to getting second. And it was by a point. It was so close. It was such an exciting race. Um, and although I say that was really hard to see, the NAU woman getting second was an incredible feat for that program. That was them winning would have been amazing, obviously, but them getting second was the next best thing. I mean, they they're a team that's been around since 1980 when Title IX started changing the landscape of NCAA and making sure that we're introducing women's programs. And in 1991, they got third. So they were only around for 11 years, the first time when they got on the program, but then they didn't get on the podium again until 2023. It's been a long, hard road for this woman's program to get back to the top. And Mike Smith really made it a point that when he came in and he took over the program, there is absolutely no reason that the woman can't be succeeding like the guys. They have all, they have everything that the guys do. They have the same facilities. They have the same, the same altitude. They're breathing the same air up here. There's no reason that they couldn't be succeeding like the guys. Um, and so, yeah, I think they think they're going to be hungry. I think they're going to be, they're going to be wanting to get that national title this year. They've had two individual cross country titles that the men's team can't boast about. We've never had an individual title on the men's side on the grass. Um, and one person who I'm really excited to watch actually is Maggie. I mean, she's come off an incredible track season and for the women's race, milers matter. It's, it's 6k. It's not like the 10k where oftentimes for the milers, they just don't have the strength. They don't have the legs to handle the distance for the women's race. That's not always the case. So I think she's going to be someone to really watch out for this season. I'm glad he brought up Maggie Congdon because I, I agree. She, after watching her run at NCAAs, I was like, she is going to be a huge factor come cross country season. And to your point too, like I think if you're looking at this squad, right, like they return athletes like that, but and also other athletes like Elise Stearns, like they do have a lot of that solid foundation right there. It's just a lot of the same athletes returning. Corey, you know, we saw what happened last year. What do you think it's going to take then for this group? You know, a lot of these same ladies to get it done this year in 2024. Well, it's got to be the same formula. Obviously, they were that close because they were capable of winning. They just ran up against NC State, which, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, three Peter right there. I think two years ago, they were on the cusp. Last year, they proved they were the, they were there. This year, it's just sort of about continuing that, that momentum that you've built already and trying to capitalize on your moments that you have. Um, you have a really great roster of, of women, and a lot of these women weren't necessarily stars before they reached NAU. Elise Stearns is a great example. She came from uh, Montana, and she was not a star in high school, came to NAU, really grew and became someone that's capable of winning. And I think she she is a contender for the NCAA title this year, but you got a transfer in Carrie Beloga from Colorado, had a great year at, in, in the 3K steeple outdoors, and I think you put the pieces together. You have the depth. Now it's just about capitalizing when that moment comes. Well, I know that these are all three big storylines we're going to be looking forward to seeing develop over the season. There's plenty of other storylines, but I mean, hey, I think now it's time, you know, after going through all of that, I think it's time that now we release our preseason rankings. And this year we're doing something a little bit different at FlowTrack. We have a new FlowTrack ranking system. And so we're going to go ahead and explain to you exactly how these cross country rankings are going to work in 2024. This is the first year we're using a new system. We're dubbing it, I believe, the Flow Track Power Index or the FPI, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that, that pulls data from, it's a, it's a database system. It pulls data from TFERS and MILESPLIT, factoring both finish at the 2023 NCAA Cross Country Championships along with track performances from 2024 that creates essentially a calculated list that tries basically to predict or list essentially the predicted finish at this year's 2024 NCAA Cross Country Championships. So pretty exciting, right? Very exciting. It's different. I mean, the way you look at rankings it typically is subjective, right? You have a panel of coaches that are voting on, you know, who should be ranked in the top 25. This isn't necessarily that. It's based on data, and data drives the rankings. So now for the purposes of this show, well, first off, you'll be able to go later online to, to flow track. You can see our entire list of 
31 teams, then I think around 250 individuals ranked. So you can look at that later. But for the purposes of this show, we're going to dive into the top 10 individuals and teams throughout the men's and women's Division One. So let's go ahead and go into it. Let's begin first with the Division One men's individual rankings. We're going to begin first with numbers 10 through 6. So beginning at number 10, we have Ernest Chariot of Texas Tech. He debuted for Texas Tech during the outdoor track season. He was fourth in the 10K at the 2024 NCAA Outdoor Championships. He has a blazing fast 10K PR of 27.52.13, which he clocked at the Brian Clay Invitational. I think based on his track times alone, you can see how he can make an impact this fall. Absolutely. And this is the first opportunity on the grass to produce for a team that seems to be a very sneaky surprise uh, in the Big 12 and potentially beyond that, too. I know we'll dive a little bit more into Texas Tech later, but let's go ahead and move to number nine. We have Parker Wolf of UNC, the 2024 NCAA Outdoor 5K champion. He was third in the 5K at the U.S. Olympic Trials, just missed out on making that Olympic team due to world ranking. He was also ninth at the 2023 NCAA Cross Country Championships. I mean, he had such a huge year last year and now he comes into the season hungry for more this is also the product of a computer model way too low <laughs> for for parker wolf he's in in both of our eyes yeah. i believe that he's probably a stronger candidate to be in the top five but this is based on data that the computer sees parker is a candidate to win ncaa's this year there, there's no ifs ands and buts about it uh, he had an incredible 2024 um, what he has to do is sort of reset go into this season and really attack because he has the potential to really knock your socks off. Looking at our number eight now, we have Ryan Shoppy of Oklahoma State. Now, he did not race cross country last year, but if healthy, I think he should be a top member of that Oklahoma State squad that we, we know is trying to come back and defend their title from last year as a team. He was eighth in the 3K indoors. He was part of a winning DMR team for Oklahoma State at those indoor championships. He's run 738 for 3K, though, during that indoor season last year. So he does have that speed if we see him out on the cross-country course. Yeah, Oklahoma State has a lot of depth. Ryan's a little underrated, I think, but he does have gears. And, and with this team, it remains to be seen sort of where Ryan may fit in 2024 uh, within the larger landscape. But, you know, if all goes well, Ryan's a guy to be watched out for in the top ten. And moving on to number seven, we see more Oklahoma State here. We have Brian Masai ranked at number seven. He was eighth at the 2023 championships in cross country. He was part of, again, that DMR winning team indoors for Oklahoma State. And then he was fourth in the 5K into the outdoors. So he knows how to perform at the highest level when it counts out in those championship stages. Yeah, and famously, he was brought in late last year in the recruiting cycle uh, under Dave Smith, who had a connection there in Kenya. And he competed right away. He, he produced right away. Uh, he is a, a proven competitor, and he can make that team really, you know, go. So uh, he's going to be a strong candidate to really help Oklahoma State. And then finally here at number six, it's a, a newcomer to the NCAA ranks. That's Justine Kikowicz of Eastern Kentucky. He's an international recruit from Kenya. He ran a 332-93, 1,500 meters to win the Sound Running Sunset Tour. I mean, my goodness, 332 is no joke. He has experience, too, racing on the Diamond League circuit, I believe. And he's going to be expected to be a front runner for, honestly, a pretty dangerous Eastern Kentucky squad. Yikes. <laughs> if experience could talk, uh, that it would talk large because just uh, Justine has a really strong opportunity here with Eastern Kentucky to lead them. Uh, he is 25 years old, so he does have a, a bit of maturity on his, under him as well. So, um, But he doesn't have a lot of racing under him. According to World Athletics, he's only raced uh, since 2021, so he's still got pretty fresh legs. So that right there, that was your 10 through 6 rankings for the men's individual rankings. Matt, do you have any first reactions to, to looking at this list and how you think some of these athletes are going to you know, be contenders here, potentially for, for individual titles come this fall? Yeah, the the thing that really stands out to me is having already, we haven't even gone through the full list yet, and we're already seeing two Oklahoma athletes. That, when I start looking at it from a team aspect, that's when I'm looking at it from someone who has had other athletes ranked in the top 10 before going into an NCAA cross country, that gets me excited because I know I'm going to have people to run with then team tactics actually start coming into a, coming into play. So if I'm an Oklahoma runner and I know I have other low sticks who are going to be with me at the front, that gives you confidence. That gives you that means you're going to have guys to train with who are right around your similar level, and it's, it's going to make them pretty dangerous at nationals. That's very true, too. I mean, if you look at how they won nationals last year, I believe they put three within that, that top 10. 
So, I mean, shoot, if you already have a couple of guys there on our rankings, I mean, that, that shows that maybe that formula can repeat again this year. Absolutely. I think the, the, based on paper, it's going to be hard to beat Oklahoma State off the bat. Uh, obviously, a lot of things change throughout the course of a season, uh, but you've got to have those pieces in place first. All right, well, we already counted down 10 through 6. Let's now reveal our top five athletes on the men's side for individuals going into the cross-country season, beginning first, number five. I think we got to mention Patrick Kiprop of Arkansas. He was seventh at the 2023 NCAA Cross-Country Championships, eighth in the 10K at the 2024 NCAA Outdoors. He is the top returner for Arkansas. I mean, he's no joke. I mean, Arkansas, too, has such a strong team, especially this year. They were fourth last year, but looking really, really deep this year. Yeah, he won the 5K at SECs, and he's just very consistent across his, his last calendar year. And that's what matters for, for an athlete who really wants to kind of build on a season uh, from, from the, the past year. You have to be consistent, and he's got that. Now, at number four, we have another international recruit that – I mean, if you just look at some of his numbers on paper, he should hopefully likely probably have an impact here at the NCAA level. That's Solomon Kipchoge of Texas Tech from Kenya. He has run 59.37 for a half marathon back in 2023. To put that into perspective, that is faster than the American record at the, at the half marathon. So just throwing that out there for everyone, just for some context. If you're looking at what he's done in 2024, he was six at the Istanbul half marathon in one hour and 19 seconds, and then fourth in the Riga half marathon in, in an hour, or 62 minutes and 15 seconds. That man fast. <laughs> and he is a man, because he's 28 years old. We do have to say, he is a little older than the typical college athlete. Uh, 10 years, in fact, for, for a high school freshman between most and him. Um, but, and he's only run on roads before. So there, is, there does have to be some adjustments to, that have to be made by Kipchoge going into the grass uh, in 2024. Now we're about to crack into the top three here. Number three, Dennis Kipengedich of Oklahoma State, fourth at the 2023 NCAA Championships. He helps lead Oklahoma State there to that team title. He was their top runner. He was third in the 10K at NCAA Outdoors this past year. I mean, this guy, again, like most of these Oklahoma State guys, right, like they've proven again and again that they belong within that, you know, that top five, that top eight, whether it's on the cross-country course or, or on the track in the 5K and the 10K. So he's going to be a big player here, I think. Like Brian, before him, he also came in last year in that July period, and he was a strong performer right off the bat, um, proven out of Kenya. He had finished third in the, the Kenyan trials. Um, you know, so, so he had proven record. He performed in 2023, and now it's sort of about taking that Oklahoma State program and continuing the legacy. You won nationals last year. Can you do it again? Now moving on here to number two, a familiar name again here. Hoptum Samuel of New Mexico. He was your runner-up at the Cross Country Championships last year. He was also the 10K champion at NCAA Outdoors in 2807-82. He was also sixth in the 5K at that same meet. And he's in just his second year at New Mexico, which is also something just to consider, like, how successful he was in just his first year at the NCAA level. And I think, you know, seeing him run, I mean, I know he also raced at the 10, and he ran one of the fastest times ever at the 10K for, for the collegiate ranks. I think he's definitely one that's going to be dangerous and, and one that can contend for that title. Yeah, he's a dominant runner with wins on his resume. And you can't overlook wins. Wins matter. Winning begins to breed culture within your own identity. So he's been in big situations before. He's been able to perform at the highest levels. And now it's just about putting that in motion. And then last but not least... How could you forget our defending champion, Graham Branks of Harvard? He is number one on our preseason rankings here. Again, he was the cross-country champion last year. He competed at the Paris Olympics, ninth in the 5K, one of only two Americans to make the final there. He overcame some injury that took him out for most of the indoor and outdoor season. Um, but he still had even, you know, I mean, had crazy performances on the track. I think back to that, that indoor mark when he ran at the BU Sharon Collier Danville opener. Uh, I mean, he ran 1303.78, which at the time was the collegiate record before it was broken by Nico Young. I mean, we've seen him perform time and time again over the past year. I think he has to be the favorite coming into this. What are your thoughts here about Graham Blinks at number one? I agree. you got to beat a champion to be a champion. And, and that 1303 was coming off cross. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, he was using that fitness and really went into that in December. Um, I think Graham is a true cross-country guy, a grinder. He's smart. He's able to position himself within races and, and run tactically sound. I think when you put him in, in a situation where you're going after a championship, he understands what it takes to win, and he's proven that. So you got to beat a champion to be a champion. 
All right, Matt, we just revealed numbers five through one. What are your thoughts here now looking at this? Again, Graham Blank's defending champion ranked number one. Just, you know, all in all, I guess from, from 10 to one, what are your thoughts on this, this overall list? Yeah, you know, the thing that actually really stands out to me is this list is, it's fairly humbling. Like I, I was, I was runner up at NCAA cross in 2017 and, and we're competing against really, really great guys. I mean, Justin Knight won. Um, but if I'm going to be super straight up, I mean, this, this wasn't the guys that I was competing against. This is, this is NCAA getting to another level. If I'm going to be perfectly honest. I mean, when you throw in a, a Solomon Kipchoge is run a, a 59 37, I would have, you asked me that a few years ago, I'd be like, that guy's winning a hundred percent every single time that person with that kind of time is going to win um and then i look at a at a hobton samuel and, and i see a 26 53 and then i'm like maybe he'll win i don't these are just times which we often we just have to get used to seeing in the ncaa and i think this is super exciting because it means the race at the front is just going to be insane it's going to be so fun to watch um yeah and, and once again Oklahoma, three athletes ranked in the top 10. I mean, that that works really well for them when they start looking at trying to fight for that team title. Well, we'll see how long these rankings shape up. Again, we're going to be updating them throughout the season. So things will, will shift as people start performing out on the cross-country course. But for now, that's our preseason top 10 for the men's Division One individuals. Let's move to the teams now, sticking with the men. Let's break down the top 10 teams for the men on the division one side of this preseason beginning first with 10 through six let's begin first with number 10 wisconsin they were 10th at the ncaa's in 2023 they return also some key names including bob liking who was in that top 100 last year and for, through most of the season was a pretty solid name there and adam spencer too has shown a lot of a lot of strength in that 1500 and competed at the olympics too for australia where's nationals in 2024 Wisconsin. Wisconsin. <laughs> Got to watch out for the hometown team, naturally speaking. They're a bit underrated, I think, if you look at the grander you know, picture of can they win a title. But that being said, hometown team, there's a lot of advantages there. Of course, yeah, that home course advantage could play a factor there. Moving on to number nine, we're looking at New Mexico here on our rankings. They were 18th in 2023, so projecting them to finish a lot higher this year. They return, obviously, a low-stick runner and runner-up Hopton Samuel, as well as Evans Kiplagat, who was very strong for them last year. Um, you also see promise, too, in some athletes for them, like Victor Chirchir, who's gone 28-19 for 10K, who could be a big contributor, kind of make it a top three for them this fall. They have three guys ranked in the top 50 of our initial rankings here, and I think that's a great start. Now, that we'll have to maybe improve some depth over the back of the, the order, but I think they have the pieces in place to really be competitive. Now, looking at number eight here on our list, I think this is an intriguing team to keep an eye on this season, and that's Stanford. They were eighth in at 2023 at those championships. They lose some big names, namely Kai Robinson. But, you know, after, I think if you look at their season last year, it was a little bit up and down at times, but they were able to come out with that, that strong top 10 finish when it counted at nationals. And, you know, they still have some depth, right? A lot of guys right there together, kind of at that same talent level. What do you think of Stanford going into this year? I feel like they've always sort of been on the cusp. We felt like Stanford really had a shot, I think, last year to really do something um, in terms of going after a title and didn't really come up with it. But I think they might be a year away. They have a lot of young guys. They do have some experience, but it, it's really about kind of making sure that they mesh together. They run in the pack. They run a smart tactically. And I think Stanford has the, the runners that can get the job done but it might come, you know, looking at their roster, it feels like they might be a year away. We'll have to see if they, the year is now or if it is a year away, but we'll see what Stanford does. Looking at number seven, you have the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. They were 14th in 2023. I think what's intriguing about this team is they almost have a combination of, they have some veterans and guys like Carter Solomon, who are some older guys on the team with more experience. But then you also have some newer guys come in who are some of, you know, they're some of the best high schoolers in, the, in their time, and they could add some, some talent there as well. I, I agree, and I think we've learned that graduate transfers can make a huge impact for, for squads. Solomon, you mentioned Josh Mether is also a graduate student. Uh, he's been with Notre Dame for, for his tenure there. I think how they mix with some of the young guys like Drew Griffith and Ryan Pajak will be the story of Notre Dame this year. They have all, an immense amount of talent um, putting it all together and, and seeing if they can get a top five finish at Nationals. 
And then lastly here on this 10 through 6 list at number 6 is Eastern Kentucky. Now this is an interesting one here. They were 31st in 2023, so dead last in 2023. But they begin our season here at number 6. Strong international recruiting, I think, could help them here this year. They add, as we mentioned, 332, 1500-meter runner Justine Kipkoic to the squad for a good low stick. So potentially we could see them move up quite a bit this year. Yeah, I agree. I think the jury's out on Eastern Kentucky to see what they do. But when you have that low stick that can really produce potentially top 10, top 5 finish, it's really going to help your, your, your standards there at the national level. So those are your top, your, your, your 6 through 10 teams there on the men's side. Matt, you know, any first gut reactions to these? Do you think this, you know, makes sense, you know, based on what you've seen from these teams, you know, looking at last year and then coming into this year? Yeah, you know, when you were talking about Wisconsin and and them being on a home course this year, I I got in trouble back in 2018 for making a comment about how Wisconsin are going to have the home course advantage and they're going to need it because NAU <laughs> was just significantly better at the time and 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 Flow Track helped me with uh, getting some good backlash <laughs> with that. Um, but I'm going to double down on it. They're going to need the home course advantage again, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. But in saying that, this Wisconsin course, you do need the home course advantage. I think that honestly is going to help them outperform wherever they're going to rank um, because you you need to run the course smart. And I think that's going to help. And, you know, honestly, the one, as you, as you were really pointing out there, Eastern Kentucky, if you're going from 31st, which as you were saying is dead last, you have nothing to lose. You can literally only do better unless you don't make the national meet, which would obviously be worse. Um, you go to nationals, you can only do better. And so this is gonna be a big motivator for them. If you're going from last to suddenly, hey, we're kind of in contention. Like we, if you're, if you're six, you have a chance of getting on the podium. Um, and so I think that's gonna, they're gonna be definitely ones to look out for. Cause as I said, they have nothing to lose this season. Yeah, you know, you mentioned, you know, that home course too. I mean, it's definitely no easy course by any means there up in Wisconsin. I think we're going to see, you know, a lot of these teams where they're at based on how they perform at, at Nuttycomb and pre nats So I think, you know, as the season goes along, we'll see how these, these teams decide to tackle this course and then potentially on NCAAs. So that's 10 through 6. Let's now move on to 5 through 1 of our men's Division One team rankings. Let's go ahead and begin here with number 5, and that is going to be Iowa State. They're fifth in 2023. They return one of their stars in Masandando. Um, from last year, he was 16th in NCAAs. Iowa State, I mean, they were very strong last year, again, strong this year. Like, I think they're a team that could be sneaky when it comes NCAA time and, and regional time. I don't know. What are your thoughts here? I agree completely. I think they are a sleeper on the national stage. They have a star. They have a guy like Gable Saperda, who is third in the 3K Staple Chase outdoors. They have depth. They always have a good roster. Uh, so I think Iowa State's a sleeper. Now looking here at number four, we have Northern Arizona. Big year here, obviously, like we've already mentioned with NAU. Lots of change again last year for Mike Smith coaching this team and at the cross-country level. They were runner-ups in 2024, but they've won five national titles since 2016. And again, like we mentioned, a lot of change. No Nico Young, no Drew Bosley, Aaron Lazares, and Brody Hasty. Those are four of their top five men from last year's championship. So we're going to have to see you know, some of these guys that they've recruited and some of their younger guys really step up and, and really make a name for themselves and help NAU to potentially a podium finish. It's Northern Arizona. There is a <laughs> legacy factor there, and I think you've got to consider them to be a contender every year regardless. I've heard really good things about Kale Grotenhus, uh, who comes into this lineup, and he, he reached outdoor finals of the 5K and, and 10K outdoors. Uh, but really, it will all depend on how these men develop under Mike Smith, how they mesh toward the end of the season, if they can find that that really great spark toward the end, I think they have a chance. Now moving on to our top three on our podium right now in the preseason. Looking at number three, we have BYU. They were third last year at NCAAs as a team. They do have some big names returning. James Corgan, who we saw compete at the Olympics. He was 32nd at this meet last year. You also have a guy like Casey Klinger. Now, he didn't run cross country for them last year, but he was fifth this past summer at the Olympic trials in the 5K. So he's still back with this team and plenty more. Like, BYU is always a team that's going to have depth, I think, if you look at them. And, you know, they're going to be looking to, to try to win a title, too, I think. Yeah, and they have maturity. I think that goes unsaid a lot of times about BYU or maybe overstated. I, I don't know. Uh, Casey Klinger is 25. Aiden Troutner is 23 or 24. They have maturity. 
uh, beyond just the experience and the talent. Um, and sometimes you have to understand like the moment, and you can't get riddled with the pressure. So I think this team deals with it really well every single year, and that maturity is going to help them. And now moving to number two, we're looking at the Arkansas Razorbacks taking that runner-up spot right now in our rankings. Fourth last year at the championships, they returned to their top guys, including Patrick Kiprop, Karami Yego, Ben Shearer. Plus, they have a big transfer in Yassine Yas Abdallah from Tennessee. He just ran a 211 marathon at the Paris Olympics, and he was 11th in the 5K at NCAA Outdoors. Obviously a big add to an already really deep team. Like this seems like a team, like if you look at all the pieces, that has the makings of a, a national title winner. They do. They're going for it. This is a year where they are going after the national title. It, it will be very difficult with Oklahoma State, but Arkansas has put the pieces together to get go after a national title, and I think time will tell if they can do it. And then, of course, I think this is no surprise, coming in at number one, defending champions, Oklahoma State. They returned all but one of their top five from the championships last year. Last year, they went 4, 8, 10, 12, and 15 to beat powerhouse NAU by 22 points. And I think already looking at you know how we, the individuals were ranked, it's, it's looking like they could potentially have such a huge year here. Again, so much depth. Do you think they're going to win another title this year? <laughs> I kind of, yes, I do, I do, I do. You have five runners inside the top 15 in this data model or flow track power index. That was your national title. I think they overperformed even what we thought they would perform to in 2023. So it's really just about improving, making sure you have the right guys in the right situations and they're all healthy and ready to go. And I think Oklahoma State's going to be very, very hard to beat. All right, those are your team rankings there. We're going to throw it to Matt first, though, get your reactions there. Can Oklahoma State win another title? I know your guys in AU are up there at four. You know, how do you think, how do you think this is all going to shake up? Like, do you think this is a fair representation of how they should be going into this preseason, maybe? I, I definitely think it's fair. And I, I always like the respect as, aspect of when you won a national title last year, you should probably be ranked number one, unless there's been a significant change to your program uh, starting off the next year. And Look, I mean, it's it's always tough not seeing NAU uh, not ranked number one, seeing them ranked number uh, number four. And it's tough because we haven't seen it very often, to be perfectly honest. But as you're saying, I mean, when, you, when you're taking out Nico, Drew, Aaron, Theo, Brody, I mean, those are really heavy hitters who, to give all of them credit, have done significant things for the NAU program. All of those guys helped this team win national titles. But... All good things come to an end with when you have people on the team. The one thing I will say, if, if there's a will, there's a way. NAU often will find a way. Um, they have great guys on the team, really excited young blood who are looking to step up, which is exciting. Uh, but I will say, I mean, in all credit to Oklahoma, that they're going to want this. I, I was there in 2022 when when it was uh, a real back and forth of who won, is it Oklahoma or NAU? And it was probably honestly one of the most exciting back and forths when there was protests and we're trying to figure out who was top of the podium. And uh, when NAU beat Oklahoma on their home course, I think that really hurt. Uh, and that's probably the reason why they came out firing the next year and beat NAU by as much as they did. And they're going to keep doing that. They're going to keep wanting to come, bring that fire, and do everything they can. And, and the other additional exciting one is Arkansas. I mean, when, when you're talking about programs that know winning, that's them. They're the winningest cross-country program in NCAA history. They know winning. Um, and so for them to be getting this close to another national title, I mean, I don't know if they have room for another trophy in their cabinet, but they're going to they're gonna certainly try. Goodness, just so many powerhouse programs here at the top of our rankings going into the season. But, you know, that does it through our run through of the men's rankings. I think now we got to switch gears to the women's, beginning first with our women's individuals. And I think we're going to see some familiar faces, also some new faces as well here in our top 10. So let's first begin with 10 through 6 on the women's individual side for D1, beginning first with number 10, Kaylee Caesar of Utah, 26 at the 2023 Cross Country Championships. She was 18th at the Mountain Regional ninth at the Pac-12 championship. So she performed very well for Utah, you know, which is a, a, a pretty solid program itself, too, on the cross-country course last year. Yeah, proven low stick. She's good in big moments. Fifth at Roy Griak, ninth at Pac-12. I mean, she understands how to race in big situations, and I think she's going to bring that experience to Utah this year. Now at number nine is someone that ran for a different team last year during cross-country, transferred for track, and is now with NAU. That is Carrie Beloga. 
You know, she was 82nd last year at cross country championships. Not her best performance. But then on the track, she made a name for herself in the 3K steeplechase. She was eighth in that final NCAA outdoors. She also finished eighth at the Pac-12 championships on the cross country course as well. So she can put it together when it counts on the course. And I think I'm curious to see how she fits in with this NAU team. Yeah, it was only a couple of years ago she won for Locker Nationals. So she's capable of winning a national championship. She proved that in high school. Different situation here as she transferred over to Colorado and now has a different coach, but I think it's going to bode her well, and she's going to have an opportunity to really have a big impact. Sticking with the NAU theme here at number eight, we have Elise Stearns. She was 20th last year, fourth in 2022 at the championships in cross. She won the Big Sky Championship and the Virginia Invitational, so she knows how to win. She is one of those girls that could potentially, I think, contend for an individual title. She didn't run much indoors and outdoors, but she'll be looking to step back onto the course in 2024. Yeah, I think this is my Parker Wolf moment where she's ranked too, yeah. too low here. I think Elise Stern should be in the top five. No ifs, ands, and buts about it. I think she proved last year that she can win races. Um, and what hurt maybe is, is, is that NCAA championship race, but that was a tough course. Yeah. Everybody kind of struggled on it. So I really think Stearns is going to be in the conversation for a top five finish. Now moving on to number seven, we have Rosina Machu of Gonzaga. She was 16th last year. She also had three meet wins underneath her belt last season. She won the WCC Conference Championship there. 15th in the 10K at, at the Outdoor Championships uh, this past June. So she also has experience, you know, competing against the best at the highest level of NCAA. Yeah, really good potential out there in Gonzaga. She has an opportunity, I think, to shoot up the rankings because she's performed on a number of courses and she's run pretty fast times. And then at number six, someone who I think kind of had a breakout year last year, I think that's Sydney Thorvaldson of Arkansas. She won the South Regional and then she finished 11th at NCAAs in cross. She was 7th in the 10K and 13th in the 5K at Outdoors. I mean, I think there's a lot we can say about her. Like, again, I think she put together the pieces for a very complete season last year throughout, you know, cross, indoor, and then into outdoor as well. Yeah, unquestioned number one for Arkansas, now leading a program that is trying to, to put some things together. Um, experienced, reached big finals in the 5K and 10K at Nationals. So I think Sydney has a big year ahead for her. All right, Matt, we're going to throw to you again, 10 through 6, a couple NAU athletes in there as well. What do you think so far looking at this list of women going into the preseason? Yeah, one of the things which I always look for is people who have experience running an NCAA cross. I think that's one of the fundamental things you want, especially if you're looking for, for team titles as well, um, because the meet is different. I mean, you have so many people on the line, the conditions and running on the grass, and you just want to know that you have people who have been there, done that before, and keep can keep a cool, calm head through it. And I think that's what you're seeing through, through these women. And I'm excited about NAU. Like I was, I was hyping up Oklahoma just before. I mean, I'm I'm loving seeing Carrie and Elise and and the top ten here. And and you really do need low sticks for a team. You need people who are going to be out the front who can who can give your team confidence that like, hey, we're in a really good place. We're not all running together back in thirtieth, fortieth, or something. You want to know there are people on your team. Uh, challenging for for possibly the win, I think that gives a team a, a lot of confidence, and it's going to be interesting with this with this ten through to six that with no Parker this year, is someone going to take it out hard, or are we going to see more of a pack sticking together? Are we going to have all of these women in it right to the finish? I don't I don't know. It's good. there's always someone who who often gets itchy feet and 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 takes it out, but. I think there's a chance that there's going to be a big pack this year and, and all of these women are going to be in contention towards the end. I think that's a good point, right? Like, I know we were talking about it. Like, is there anyone who's the next Parker Valby this year? Is it just a completely different landscape? You know, I think it's, it's interesting, right, to look at the women because you just have, like, there's no one that, like, yeah, there are plenty of athletes that I think have, like, the makings of, like, they could, could dominate NCAAs. But, I mean, the way Parker Valby did it last year is just a whole nother level, I think. Yeah, there's, there's a type of confidence with the way she raced that few even trust themselves to employ while they're out there. I don't think we'll necessarily see that this year. I think we could see some distancing uh, of, of athletes as we get you know, down the list a little bit. There's, <laughs> yeah. there's a couple of them that stand out in particular, but I think that this year has the potential to sort of bracket off a little bit. Well, let's go ahead and then move on to those athletes down the list. Let's look at athletes five through one on the women's individual rankings. Let's go first to number five. Salon Ildes of Oregon transferred to South Carolina, 
following the cross country season, or transferred from South Carolina, excuse me, following the cross country season last year. She was 11th at the Southeast Regional, didn't make it to nationals. However, I think what you've seen from her on the track points to potential success of the cross country course. She ran 409 for 1500, 1515 for 5K during outdoors. You know, I think she's someone that can make an immediate impact for that for the Oregon Ducks. Yeah, the range is impressive from her and having now that full year under our Schumacher. Um, let's see what happens with it. But I think fall, he can get a lot out of her as she kind of moves into that position where she can lead Oregon. Now here at number four, a key grad transfer for Washington. That's Amina Matug. She's a grad transfer from Duke. She was ninth last year at NCAA, so she's finished top ten there before. She was second at the South Reese Regional and the ACC Championships. And again, going back to range, she's gone 410 for 1500 and 846 for 3K. So she can kind of do it all. And for a Washington squad that's kind of on the cusp there and has been for quite some time with you know, getting on the podium, winning championships. Like, she's a big ad, I think, for them yeah. as well. She broke Duke's 5K record last year, 1537. And I think she is a little bit of a sleeper on this stage. I think she has a potential to, to maybe surprise us at, at the national level. Um, joining a, a team like Washington that really values pack running, mm -hmm. um, I think is going to do wonders for the Huskies. And I think they, they could sneak up a little bit in the rankings. Now moving on to number three, we have Chloe Scrimgore of Georgetown. Big year for her last year, eighth at NCAA. She was the Big East champion. If you're looking at what she did on the track, she was seventh in the 3K and the 5K at indoor championships, and then fifth in the 10K at outdoors. I, I saw her run last year, and I think she was one that like maybe wasn't on people's radar until the season started, right? But I think now she comes in, and she's going to be a favorite to potentially win a title. Yeah, strong runner, seasoned, a veteran. I think she ran a really tough course well last year, and Georgetown had some things that didn't exactly go their way at, at cross last year. So she comes back, and really this is her time to really prove that she's capable of winning a title. She's improved every single season on grass. So, you know, from, from this point, she's got a – better the eighth place which is tough but I think she has a good opportunity and then moving on to number two I think this was one of the biggest transfers going into the season and that is Hilda Olamomoy originally of Alabama transfers to Florida going into this year third at NCAA cross second in the 5k and 10k to only Parker Dalby at the outdoor championships she has 31 51 10k speed she's gone 1506 over 5k outdoors that's one of the fastest marks in collegiate history at the outdoor 5k alone i think hilda is one of those athletes that has a lot of that momentum to to be a star this year now that you know parker valby's graduated and i think some of that spotlight opens up 100 percent. and i think going to florida working under will palmer palmer is, is a great opportunity for her to grow uh even from from having such a great season i think when you follow someone like parker valby there's a lot of expectations put on a team but hill has got just as much talent um, equal talent. So I think they can get a lot from her this year. And then lastly here, our top athlete going into the season on the women's side is the top returner from NCAAs last year, and that's Doris Lemongole of Alabama, second last year at the championships only to Parker Valby. She then outdoors on the track set the collegiate record in the 3K steeplechase, 9-15-24. That is no joke whatsoever. She was also third in the 3K and fourth in the 5K at the indoor championships up in Boston. I think, you know, if you look at some of these top, top athletes here, Doris and Hilda kind of are in the same ballpark, right? Like, I think they were kind of those ones that, you know, they're the ones to basically just to, to step up next, I think. Yeah, the only person in front of Doris last year was Parker. Yep. And now the runway is clear for, for Doris to really run her own race and, and maybe win a title. I think few were as, as, as prolific as her last year, and now – it's really a chase to see if you can compete with Doris. I mean, will, will anyone sort of compete on her level? That is my question. But I think she's the clear number one. Plenty of talented athletes here on this women's individual rankings in that top 10. Matt, any final thoughts here now that we've revealed, you know, top returner Doris is number one. You also have Hilda as well, that big transfer from Florida. Any thoughts here on, you know, how this is shaping up and how you think it could shape up through the remainder of the season? I, I really like Doris's position here. Coming in, getting beat by by Parker last year, that's going to make her excited to to think like, hey, that person's no longer here. This puts me in a really good place to win an individual title. And also, I mean, her, her NCAA record in the steeplechase, 
that's that translates perfectly to cross country. Steeplechase is all about strength. And if you can run well at the steeple, you're probably going to run well on the grass as well. So it just shows she's made another step since cross country last year. She's going to be in an even better place uh, going into this year. But also, I mean, Hilda, when you're a runner up twice at NCAA Outdoors, you're going to want to win. You're, you're going to be hungry for a national title to be that close and not quite get there. Um, she's going to be coming in and she's going to be trying to do everything she can uh, to get her own individual title. Well, I know we'll see a new individual champion crowned at the end of the 2024 season, and we'll see how these individual rankings shape up throughout the season. But finally, I think we have to dive into these Division One men's, or excuse me, women's team rankings, beginning first with 10 through 6 then five through one. Let's look first at number 10, and that is going to be Alabama. Seventh at the championships last year. Again, they lose Hilda Olomomoy. She transferred to Florida. She was the number two runner, but still so strong with, with Doris Lemongole at the front, and then Joy Gill, who was 53rd last year for this squad, and fourth at SECs and fourth at the South Regional last year. They are a very strong squad. Yeah, they have three runners in the top 50 of our rankings, but depth will be an issue. If you really want to score at Nationals, you really have to put those pieces together. So um, Alabama has some work to do, but I think they have the potential there. Now, number nine, on paper, seeing this name may seem a little surprising, but Lipscomb takes our, our ninth spot here in the preseason. But then if you look at their resume, it kind of makes sense a little bit. They were 11th at NCAAs last year. They were the ASUN champion last year as well. They, they perfect scored that race to win that championship there, their conference title. Fifth at the South Regional. If you look at who they're returning, or they're returning all their big guns and then also add a transfer in Linda Perez from UC Riverside. What do you think of Lipscomb here? <laughs> I mean, big conferences, big conference teams don't always have to take up all the positions, right? You have teams like Lipscomb that, that really can have their place in, in the market and really compete. And I think they carved out a really great place uh, you know, for, for them in the A-Sun. And having Linda Perez as a transfer is a really good option to, to really um, em embolden them, I think, in this, in this year. Looking at number eight, you're going to have the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. They were fourth last year at a really strong effort at the championships last go around. They won the Great Lakes Regional last year, fourth at ACC's. You know, if you're looking at their roster here this year, they lose the Markazic sisters, but they have plenty of strong depth that I think can help fill in, you know, some of those lost spots. Yeah, Notre Dame's always a team that's in the mix here. I think coached by Matt Sparks, and I think you know putting uh, that that historic, you know, value in place here. I think they have a shot. Looking then at number seven, you have Utah, thirteenth last year in NCAA's, fifth at Pac-12s, third at the Mountain Regional. Obviously, they've performed well in their region, and then made it within that top 15 at NCAAs. What do you think of this Utah squad? I think they're one that's going to be intriguing, one I'm going to be looking for, you know, as the season starts. Two top runners within the top 15 of our, of our rankings. They're going to have strong value up front in their roster. Um, and I think, you know, working toward the back, you know, what can they do as they fill out the depth piece of, the, of that equation? And I think that's where you're going to get your answer. And then here at number six, we have BYU, 14th last year in NCAAs. They had an off day at last year's championships, right? But we know they have a very strong squad that, that goes really deep as well. They were also the Big 12 champions last year, second at the Mountain Regional. They return a lot of athletes as well this year. Like, I think this is a team that potentially this is underrating them a little bit, I think. And I think, you know, just because they finished 14th last year, I think they can do so much better this year. I agree. I think there are a couple of cases we've already discussed with the model that we think is a little off. And I think BYU is clearly, uh, you know, a part there. They have a lot of pieces that, um, like Jenna Hutchins and Carmen Alders, who aren't really being factored in as much that they should be. And I think BYU has a strong opportunity to, to finish as a podium team, maybe even win it this year. So those are your 10 through 6 teams there on the women's side. Matt, any, any thoughts here again? You know, especially, I think, of teams like BYU that maybe you know, had an off year at a championships, and now they're trying to bounce back like, you know, from your perspective and you know, running at the collegiate level. Like, how do teams, how are teams able to do that, bounce back from something like that and have a better performance the next year, do you think? Yeah, it's all it's all about how you respond to that type of adversity when when you believed you're in a place to perform better and, and you didn't quite on the day. And it's because, I mean, you're relying on an entire team and you need five, six, sometimes you're relying on a seventh as well to, to be healthy and be ready to go on the day. And, and it doesn't take much 
I mean, you have one person who just goes out a little bit too hard and then they go full electric with a K to go and that could be your team done. It's just, but that's also the thing which makes it exciting because you don't know, you don't know when that's going to happen. But I really like the position that BYU's in because they have a really strong men's and women's program at the moment. When you have those two things matching up, it means both of those teams are going to push each other. They're both fighting for the same thing. They're both fighting to get themselves on the podium. And when you have that momentum at practice and that excitement and you have similar goals, I, th I think that really pushes them. Uh, when I when I look at Alabama, I, th I think that's going to be a little hard with them losing Hilda because when you have an athlete who's who's as strong as that um, and they move on to to another program, which is, which is great for her, um, but it just means you can lose a little bit of momentum. Uh, so I really hope that they can... Uh, find themselves some some other strong athletes within the team who are really ready and willing to step up and and they can maybe move down the rankings as the season goes along yeah for sure i think all good points there and we'll see again 10 through 6 some of those teams kind of on the outside looking in at the podium let's dive in now to five through one the teams that we think could really make a run for a national title here in 2024 let's begin first with number five and that is going to be the oregon women 10th at 2023 ncaa's fourth at the Pac-12, second at the West Regional. I think, you know, we've seen, I think we've seen them develop, especially on the women's side over the course of the track season. And they've had some, some key ads as well that I think will be a big factor going into this fall. I think they're one star away. I think yeah. they have a really good team. They'll perform uh, at a high level, but if they had one more star, I feel like I would put them up a little bit higher. And I think that's just a matter of time with Oregon. It is Oregon. I think they have a strong roster. They have Maddie Elmore as a really veteran piece uh, for, for that women's team. I think they'll uh, really perform at one more roster spot, I think. They're, they, they elevate. Interesting. We'll see if they're just one away as the season goes along. Looking now at number four, we have, despite losing Coach John Carlson, we have Tennessee. Six at NCAAs last year. They also have, you know, one of their top returners returning as well, Ashley Jones, 42nd at 2023 NCAAs. I think she's going to be a key factor for this team and being someone that can add some of that experience to the squad. What do you think here of Tennessee and how they're positioned? So Justin Duncan was uh, basically a protege at Oklahoma State. He takes over at Tennessee, and he's got good credentials. So Tennessee loses a great coach, but they're gaining somebody that has a lot of value. And I think you know when you lose a coach, sometimes morale or an effect changes. Um, but they still have really talented members uh, of their team, um, and I th and I think they have an opportunity to continue building momentum from last year. Now at number three, you know, we saw the men's side that the defending champion on the team side was number one in our preseason rankings. Not the case here for the women. We have the NC State women, the three-time defending champions, at number three. You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of a new squad in a way. You don't have Caitlin Tui, you don't have Kelsey Camille, but you still have plenty of experience on that squad. And you also add a strong transfer in Fiona Smith, who is the D3 champion. She's also a record holder at that level. So I think that you slaughter in and maybe the Wolfpack can, can get something done. I think that's huge. I think you get someone of, of that character and that uh, experience, it's going to make a difference. We saw it last year with, with North Carolina on the men's side. So I think that's a great addition. You also have some talented freshmen that could potentially make an impact, Bethany Mahalik and Ellie Shea. And I think you can you still have a really good team of veterans that can put this 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 team through the ringer. Leah Stevens leading it up top. I think they they could still chase after a title. Agreed. I think it's pretty close here among some of these top teams in our preseason rankings. And then, you know, looking at number two, I know we mentioned Amina Matug earlier, big transfer for Washington. We have them ranked at number two here going into the season. Eighth at 2023 NCAA is have some good depth, again, adding a good transfer there from Autug. And, you know, once you put all those pieces together, like you said, they like to pack run. And, you know, if they can do that successfully on the day at Nationals, they could be in contention for a title. Yeah, you have a great coaching staff there. Marisa Powell leads that team magnificently. And I think, you know, with her in charge and having a good lineup that runs together, you know, you don't have individual pieces trying to make it work. You have a whole team that runs together, and that's sort of the mentality that Washington has. I think that's when you start to see a lot of good success. Then lastly, at number one, Matt, I promise we didn't skew these rankings or the community model in any way to influence this in your, your favor. But Northern Arizona takes the top spot here. Runner-ups, as we mentioned last year, lost by just a single point to NC State, but returned some key players and have some new additions as well that – I mean, hey, maybe this is the year for them, finally. 
Yeah, we already mentioned it. Ellie Stearns, for me, national title contender. Kerry Beloga, great transfer over from Colorado, has uh, an, you know can run a low stick with Stearns. And then we talked about Condon. You know, Peyton Gotts, he's an athlete that didn't really get a chance last year, but she was a new newcomer. Kara Moore, I, I think they got a really a, a good lot of, of women who can can perform and, and, and really execute. All right, there you have it. Our, our top 10 teams on the women's side going into this season. Again, Matt, like I said, I know we tried. We didn't skew the rankings in any way, but NAU is number one here. Any thoughts here on this order? NAU at one, you have you know, NC State at number three. Like Again, like I think similar to the men's, you have a lot of powerhouses here up at the top. How do you think this could, could shape out? I think it's going to be tough. It's going to be, I mean, when I look at NC State, ranks number three, I mean, they know how to win. NC State has won multiple titles recently. They know how to put together a team, execute a race plan, uh, and and have it work on the day. So I think NC State is always one that you you have to keep at your back at the back of your minds that they're, they're always going to be around. Um, and there's just a lot of really strong women's teams this year. So you never know. You never know who's going to come out of the woodworks and who's going to put some people up the front that maybe you didn't expect. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm excited to see the NAU woman ranked number one. I, I know the journey they've come on to get here and, and it's been super exciting. I uh, My girlfriend was on the NAU team when I was on there and I saw her miss out on nationals multiple times as a team and it was really hard for them. So to see that, and it hasn't been that long um, from them missing out on nationals to now be ranked number one. It's been a really steep, steady uh, climb for them, which is super exciting. But what they need to do is what, Mike Smith always used to tell us is uh, chop wood and carry water. A very <laughs> common phrase. You just need to make sure you keep doing the basics. Just because you're ranked number one, that does not mean anything. That doesn't mean you suddenly do every kind of fancy workout in the book. You just need to keep doing the basics, keep everyone healthy, keep progressing throughout the season, keep a level head. And I think if any of you can do that, then they're going to be there at Nationals in Wisconsin with the best possible chance of trying to win. I love that. Keep it simple. Keep it level. I'm sure plenty of teams could could benefit from from that expertise there. You know, I think that's awesome. That does it here for our release of the our first ranking set of the season. And you know, if you, that's just the top ten, like I mentioned again, like we on the team side for both the men's and women's, it goes through all 31 teams, and then on the the individual side, it goes basically up to 250. So you'll want to check out Flow Track for the full complete rankings later on tonight. And then also tomorrow we'll be releasing similar rankings for Division Two and Division Three men's and women. So that's something new we're doing here and very exciting as well that we're looking forward to. Matt, again, thanks again for joining us. Love to hear your expertise here as well. And, you know, we'll have to see how your Lumberjacks do this year. I'm excited. And, and one thing which I'm going to tell people to look out for is NAU are racing their home meet, George Kite, this weekend, and we are putting on the line an NAU alumni team which has 14 <laughs> athletes. 14 guys are going to be on this NAU alumni team, guys who you are going to be excited to see. Everyone's in town for, for the NAU induction of the Hall of Fame for our first three national titles. So look out for the George Kite meet and look out for that alumni team because I think you're going to be excited by some of the names on it. Now I'm just curious who's on this team. Are you running, Matt? <laughs> you know, the best way to convince some guys to, to line up for George Kite is to make sure that there's a race at the front and there's a, a party at the back. <laughs> so I'm going to be with the party at the back. I'm going to be with the boys who, hey, they're just out there to have a good time. They're in town. Maybe they've been running. Maybe they haven't. I don't know, but... Yeah, don't don't see the names, appreciate the names, but don't don't expect too much from from the team, especially from the guys at the back. Well, we hope you enjoy that the party at the back there again. Thanks again for joining us, Matt. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Again, this does it for our first college cross country ranking show presented by Hoka. We'll see you as the season goes along. We'll continue to have episodes as new rankings drop and i know we're excited to see how things shake up this cross country season see you and next time importantly if you don't like the rankings add us on instagram on twitter everywhere let us know. we want the criticism you know yes. <laughs> all right guys thanks again for joining us we'll see you next time